Good morning, Andrews University. Good morning. I love it when people respond. If you want to wave, I see someone back there. Hi. If you see someone who's still coming in, you know the drill. Just pull them in beside you. Make friends maybe first. Let's all stand together as we praise God this morning. with me.
You are the creator God as much as the redeemer God. And we pray, Father, this morning, as has happened through our praise and as will happen through the message, that you restore in us the image that you desire for us to be. That in all that we do, we bring glory to your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. This morning's chapel speaker could be called many things. There are many names that I could give him. Presently, you might know him as Dean Mattingly, since he is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. You may know him as Dr. Mattingly, if you've ever been in his classroom. You might also know him, unlikely though, as Chaplain Mattingly. For a long time, in many years, he served uh, in the Army Reserves as a chaplain and did serve time away. You might also know him as Pastor Mattingly. And that's perhaps the title that means the most. Because he's not a title kind of guy to begin with. He's the kind of guy that really cares truly about your final destination. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he begins this morning's message referencing where he would like to see you. So I hope you give him your full ear and heart as he shares with us this morning. Well, we welcome you to another beautiful day in southwest Michigan. That's my greeting all my classes, even when it was snowing. It was particularly important when we were snowing. I bumped into two kinds of people when it comes to the style of how do they hear God. On the one hand, there are those who claim to be hearing God that you wonder about. How annoying are the super spiritual who always say, oh, God told me this, uh, God told me that, uh, God told me the other, and, and it seems that every single thought is a revelation from God as if God did not give them a brain. Hmm, they have, to, they have to say, God told me. And some have told me that they leave everything to God to include even when they wake up in the morning. I'm just going to go to sleep, and I'm going to depend on God to wake me up whenever he wants to wake me up. I've tried that. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, not for me. I've discovered that God and I have to talk about when to set that alarm. We come to an understanding with each other then that we'll wake up at such and such time. Back when I was in the religion department teaching, being the chair there, we would have these conversations with some of our religion majors about prayer. Should a pastoral prayer be written? And you find these individuals who will say, you've got to get up there, you've got to kneel down and see and let God work through you as you kneel down. That's, you know, that's depending on a lot on God, that's for sure, in my mind. It's as if God only works on the spur of the moment. And I've always felt, as Jose mentioned, I was a in the military, and some of the best prayers I ever heard were prayers by Catholic priests who had taken the time to write out their prayer and craft it and craft it well. And I always, I came to the conclusion, why can't God be talking to me as I craft the prayer? Why do I have to wait to get up front and all of a sudden spontaneously expect God to be with me? There was a friend once who said, my next child is going to be a boy. God told me. Oh, really? Well, that's interesting. So the child was born and it was a girl. 
I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, did you misunderstand? God? No, no, no. I, I just, I, yes, I did. I must have misunderstood God. It's the next child that's going to be a boy. Third child was born. It was a girl. At times, we have to be very, very careful how we hear God. But on the other hand, there's these who always seem to know that God is with them, and I, I think that's a good thing. On the other hand, and I think probably more often than the other, there are those who say that somewhere along the way, I misplaced God. As one once said the other day, I realized that I hadn't seen God in quite a while, probably not since my childhood. And it's not just that I can't find God, it's just that I've even lost my sense of what God is. Why did this happen? If I had had him when I was a child, why shouldn't I have him now? So how do we hear God? And I think that one of the things that is very, very important to us is to understand there's no shortcut to spiritual understanding. We have to learn to walk with God and know his voice it's too easy for my voice and God's voice and somebody, the enemy's voice to get all confused. And who am I listening to? And I've discovered that God normally speaks to us, to me, in just a still, small voice. And it's under certain circumstances. As you read in Moses, back in Deuteronomy 4.29, Moses made it very clear, you will find him if you seek him with your whole heart. And Jesus added later, you know, the watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep. And they call him by name and he leads them out and when he has brought them out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and the sheep will follow them because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus didn't say his sheep can hear his voice. Jesus didn't say his sheep should hear his voice. What did he say? He said his sheep hear his voice. We can know that God is talking to us. There's this wonderful promise of Desire of Ages where we are reminded that when we really want to know something and we really go to God to find out what we need to know, God will tell us. We can count on it. So how do we succeed? Well, it takes a lot of time. I think too often we go to God just when we want direction. Um, God, man alive, I, I got this exam and I need your help now. Dear God, I'd like to ask her out. I need some courage right now. Um, God, I need something right now. And so we're always going to God for this direction, for direction, seeking his, uh, his wisdom and his guidance at a moment when we need to decide. When God says to us, it takes more than that. It takes just time to be together. You don't seek out your boyfriend or your girlfriend just at that moment when you want some direction. What do you think I should do? You spend time with each other just to spend time. And I think that's the way it is with God. We can't be looking for these quick fixes. Perhaps the greatest discovery for me of how to hear God's voice came when I realized that God's voice in my heart often sounds like a flow of spontaneous thoughts, a sudden idea a new thought, I've been thinking about something. And you have to get quiet. You know, the psalmist says in Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. So we've got to shut up. We've got to shut things down around us. We've got to listen. I have taught the course Personal Spirituality and Faith. In fact, I was asked to invent it back in the mid-90s. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what do I do? How do I make a spirituality course practical? Now, I'm married to, into science. My wife's the chair of the physics department, and she says, what you need, Keith, is a lab. A lab. I said, that'll go over good in a religion class. What do you mean, a lab? So we talked about it a while and actually came up with the idea of we should have a lab. Two of our classes, each week would be a lecture, and one would be going to a small group and doing a lab. And so 
I asked PMC and they let me spread all over the church in different places and we s would send groups out uh, to their spot and each week there would be an assignment before the lab and one assignment was I need you all to go out and be uh, take at least an hour of time which you have no sound no person around you maybe a pencil maybe a paper and go sit somewhere alone and just sit there and see what happens see if God talks to you well you know Beaver Point's a great place to go out to if you go out Pathfinder Hill and up the other side to the to the uh, what's up there the telescope is up there and just sit there and enjoy and just sit God talk to me well at the lab, they would report and say, this is what I discovered when I went out. One time, a young lady said, I was scared to go out to Beaver Point or to the woods. I thought somebody might attack me, so I just went into my closet. I got a blanket and covered up and sat there for an hour. And this is what happened to me. And then she discussed how God talked to her. And then a young man, one, one class said, I thought that the place to be alone is up there on the roof of James White Library. That's where I want to be alone. Now, how am I going to get up there? Hmm. And so he thought about it a bit, and he, he said, I'll climb this tree that's right beside James. Don't ever, oh, you shouldn't tell this story, maybe. <laughs> so he climbs up this tree, and the branch bent over, and he got onto the roof. He had his hour or two of meditation. It was great, he said. He could see the stars. Good. And then when he went to get down, he realized that that branch had gone back, and he wasn't quite clear what was going to happen, so he literally took a leap of faith. <laughs> he lived to tell about it. He was telling us in the lab. <laughs> now, there's more than one way to get alone. Don't do that. I, can't, I just can see it now. Safety come along. Dean Mattingly, you, you ordered somebody up onto the roof for meditation. What is this? But we do need to get alone. What I have discovered for me, and the best alone time for me, is since I've lived here, and in my community, I've been there since 1979, I have jogged for many a year. The old knees won't allow it anymore, so I walk. And this week has been some amazing moments. You go out there, there was one night, well, this morning, I walk out, the very first thing I see is the Big Dipper. Well, what's the Big Dipper pointing to but the North Star? I turn around and there is Orion. And you just sit there and say, God, talk to me as I walk for this half an hour. One night, uh, one morning this, this week, um, there's a place where I'm just going due west. I come to the end and I turn around and I turn around and this face east and you see this dawn and the colors of the dawn. It's just a beautiful moment. You're saying, God, talk to me. Or one day this week, it was so pitch black, I couldn't hardly see. I went out thinking, you have no right to be a dean. You went out here to walk in the pitch black without a flashlight. Do you know what you're doing? It was so dark. I couldn't see the edges of the road. But what happened as we went along, just a, we were close enough to dawn that just a few minutes into the walk, you could start to see things. And by the end of the half hour, I was seeing things pretty good. I was thinking, isn't this like faith? There is a time when you know with God you've got to step out, but you can't see for, for anything. You can't see. You're just taking a step. And as you walk with God, you find that things become more and more clear. My walking and jogging moments are moments in which are very precious where God talks. And all of a sudden you get these thoughts, these, these impressions, these spontaneous thoughts. And I say, God, I'm going to limit you to three ideas per walk. That's all I can remember. I don't have anything here to write with. And so when I get back, I'll write them down really quick. But no more than three, God. That's all I can handle. And so far he's been pretty good with that. One of the most critical moments I have seen in a college life of trying to make a decision is at the time of trying to make a decision. Your career, 
what major is best to uh, help you achieve that career, who should you date, who should you marry, whether to go here, whether to go there. And when making a decision, I have found that this same idea of spontaneous thoughts coming to me while I'm sitting there at these moments of meditation, God starts giving ideas. I remember once I was pastoring in Arkansas, and I got an invitation from the conference president of Florida to move to Cocoa, Florida. Now, anybody in their right mind would automatically say, that's an automatic call from God. That's Cocoa, Florida. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Do you know Cocoa Beach? Um, that's, a, that's a call from God. Well, no, you have to go out and you spend time and praying about it. And you say, God, here's my Bible. Here's me. Let's think. And you spend an hour just thinking. And what I have learned for me is I don't pray for a sign. God, please give me a sign to show me what I should do. What's worked well for me is to pray for a conviction. God, get me to the place where I think I know that I must or must not do this. I need the conviction. And then I'll watch and see how signs, God some comes along and he gives us indications of what works and what doesn't work. And I remember this particular time, I came back into the house and my wife says to me, where you been? And I said, I've been out praying, thinking about the invitation to go to Florida. I, uh, I've come to a conviction of what we should do. And she said, I have too. Well, I've been here washing dishes, <laughs> taking care of the house, okay. <laughs> Do you, do you get an undercurrent there? And I said, well, that's interesting. I'm looking for signs. I had a conviction we should go, and you have a conviction we should stay. Let's talk about it. And if any of you know my wife, over in the physics department, she's very clear about her convictions. And she was very clear. And in this case, it was based upon what we needed to do in the house. We weren't ready to move anywhere right now. This and this needed to be done. It wasn't getting done. Insurance hadn't been doing its job. It wasn't getting done. Fifteen minutes later, insurance called, and they settled everything right there. I found a contractor within the next 15 minutes, and we were scheduled to fix the house right away. And I said to her, what do we do now? What's this do for signs? And we both agreed that this was, a, this was God talking to us after we came to our convictions. To me, I have counseled more of my students in the past. When you need to decide what to do, go off and be gone for a whole day or a weekend. I've, once I arranged with one of my uh, friends in the country and one of my students decided to go camp in the woods for the weekend. Went out Friday. Um, this guy wasn't used to camping. He came back in Saturday night in the night. He was, couldn't stay out there any longer. But to me, you go out, go out to the end of, go out to Stevensville, go out to the beach, find a dune, sit on it. Just sit there and pray and talk to God. While you're thinking, there is an appropriate moment to fast. You say, God, I'm fasting not to lose weight. I'm fasting in order that I may let you know how important this is to me, this need to make a decision. Spend time in prayer. St spend time in the scriptures. And my recommendation is always pray for a conviction. Don't pray for signs. Pray for convictions. God will then come along, as that promise in Desire of Ages indicates, and he will make things clear. In my mind, all the times that I've come to a conviction after carefully seeking from God his will, I've discovered and made a, a decision from conviction. The signs have come along and supported me. And I've been just grateful for how God has done that. You've got, when you get done out there at this moment, make a decision. It's like an umpire has to make a decision and stick to it. We need to make a decision and then be willing to adjust it. There, are been, there have been moments when the decision I made, yes, it was good conviction, but it needed to be tweaked. 
and I see how God sends along messages to me in times afterwards to get this decision fine-tuned. So to me, listening to God is a matter of finding quiet time. You know, it, we, we live in an age when it's really easy to sin in private. When you open up your computer, the stuff that you can bring up on your computer, it's just you and your computer, and it's really easy to do a lot of sinning in private, is it not? When you think about what comes up there, whether it be just wasting time with games, whether it be watching movies, whether it be um, pornography, whatever it is, you can sin in private so easily, and all that stuff distracts you, and it makes it much, much harder to hear God. And what I've discovered is that the more time you spend in the Word, your faith grows. And if you want to see your faith grow, and if you want to see what it's like to hear God more, you spend more time in His Word. And then set aside this stuff that just distracts, and just say, God, I'm here to listen. I'll even forego food once in a while, just so that I can let you know how serious I want to hear you, how seriously I want to hear you. When we spend time with God, I have discovered He always answers. He always makes things clear. And He can talk through others in this process of thoughts. Just uh, recently, the um, responsibilities of taking care of the International Development Master's Program overseas came my way, and I said to the director, "Where?" I'll go visit one of your sites, and I, you pick. And she picked the country of Rwanda. And both of us looked at each other at that moment, and we said, isn't this interesting? I happen to have grown up in Rwanda between the ages of 6 and 12 on a mission station that is hard to beat. Rwanda's temperatures are just like we have now. They're never out of the low 80s and never higher at night than the mid-60s. It's just a great country to live in. And I had an opportunity just last week to go visit them. Now, how did this happen? This Don Dalhunty was impressed. Let me share that I want you, Keith, to go to Rwanda. And I see God working in many, many ways. But you got to give him the time. And so may God be with each of you as you Seek to find his will. It is my experience that it's findable. When you put your mind to it, God answers. It's not always the way we want, as you, we all well know, but I do know that God answers. He always has me and others that I've seen. So may God grant you answers because you seek him with all your heart. Shall we pray? Great God in heaven, we thank you this morning for your desire to be in our hearts, your desire to talk to us, to be a part of our life, for making it so easy for us to come and be a part of your life, to hear you. Yes, there's challenges, but we know that you promise and you follow up on your promises. So may everything that you have for this group be clear to each, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Dean Mattingly, thank you for, for sharing your wisdom, uh, for sharing your heart with us. You mentioned uh, still small voice. You mentioned uh, conviction. Uh, some people are asking uh, whether or not from your perspective or in your experience, you've heard God's voice audibly. I wish I could say yes to that, but no. I have never heard his voice audibly. To me, his voice has always come either through his word or, as I have said, through this thinking process. And even while the thinking process is going on, it's not even clear till all of a sudden I come to the realization, I've just come up with a brilliant idea. And this is a bit of a surprise. Where'd this come from? And that's where I consider God talking to me. Um, 
How would you walk someone through or help them to understand the Christian perspective, whether they're in Christianity or outside of Christianity, when you talk about the whole idea of hearing the voice of God, uh, and whether it's audible or not audible, impression, ideas, whatever, the whole concept of it just seems too mystical in a sense. How, how do you engage in conversation with someone and, and kind of explain this process um, as you've described it? The mystical is a part of life that's always a challenge. But I, I'm, I find wherever I go, when I was in Desert Storm, you know, you meet up with a, a soldier who's in crisis, when you're in a student and they're in crisis. Uh, somehow the mystical, though scary to many, is really, I find in almost every situation, somebody wants to get in touch with God and realizes that it's a mystical experience. It's something you cannot just put your finger on. You can talk about it, you can witness about it, you can share about it, but a as you talk it through, I have never found anybody that would be uh, having a problem with m being mystical. Uh, someone asks, are there some decisions that are really just up to us, and either way we choose, God has a plan for it? I believe very firmly that there are decisions that God gave us to make. He's given each of us a brain. He expects us to use it, and he finds great pleasure in our using it. And so, you know, if I'm choosing a car, I find that uh, if I want a red car or a blue car or a yellow car, God's not going to tell me to pick such and such color. I think what I need to work through with God is whether I should spend the amount of money I'm going to spend. But there are too many things where God, God sits back and he wants to see his children be creative, and he likes to see creative activity, which means I got to be making decisions all on my own. Um, someone says you mentioned fasting. Um, have you always fasted from food, or are there other ways that you have fasted that have been beneficial in your spiritual walk? Um, one of the challenges to, in my class, one of the labs we had was after a 24-hour assigned fast. So fast for 24 hours, here's the guidelines for fasting and spiritual fasting, and then at the lab talk about it. And you would discover, I discovered, that there are those who medically just should not fast. Although I did have one case where the individual told me she medically shouldn't fast, but she chose to anyway, and it worked well for her. But food isn't the only thing as we're talking here. Um, there's uh, when you read the story of Daniel, you'll find that he fasted from the really good food. I mean, the rich foods. He stuck to the only healthy foods, I guess. Um, I think there's a time for us to look at our lives and see what's consuming us. And so if TV is consuming us, we fast from TV. If music, you know, when I see people jogging around campus and I see them with earplugs, and I'm thinking, I couldn't do that. I need to be fasting from sound, from anything, while I'm doing this. Um, someone else uh, out here uh, has asked the question, uh, how, far, how far do we follow conviction sometimes? We, we go through a process maybe similar of, a, a, as to what you've described. You feel a strong leading and prompting and impression from God to make a certain decision. What do you do at times when you feel like the way in which God is leading you is actually in the face uh, of opposition from either leadership, friends, family. How do you work through in a situation like well, that? The nutshell is you always go with your godly-led conviction. The um, caveat you add to that quickly, I do, is I need to be listening. And if indeed everybody's against me, I need to listen and figure out if there's something I missed in the first place. But if there's not, then I go with my conviction. And God, I, it's amazing when you go with a conviction that you have thought through and others have uh, reacted to and then you've still stuck to your conviction, it's amazing what God does with people when they, when they work under those kind of convictions. Um, yeah, I, we're gonna ask for your wisdom here. I was actually just meeting with a, a young man uh, this morning in, in the campus ministry's office who was ask, asking the, this very same question. Um, 
what wisdom can you just offer us in general when it comes to uh, those of us that are struggling to, to stay in connection with God? What kind of wisdom can you offer us that, uh, not necessarily the pat answers, but what has been most meaningful to you, how you advise others that are really trying to maintain our connection and, uh, and deepen in our relationship with him? One of the pragmatic things that I have chosen to do, and when I stick to it, I wish I could say I did 100%, but if you, for instance, say, God, I need to have special time for you, and I'm so busy. Um, before becoming a dean, I thought I was busy. Now I'm really busy, God. I've got this and this to worry about, so I'm always busy. I mean, I'm busy all day long, all night long. I have to answer fe emails. When do I have time? And one of the things that I have discovered that makes a difference is I say, regardless of when I go to bed, I'm going to get up then, I'm going to spend some time in the Word, and then I'm going to take that now walk or jog in the past. And I'm going to be out there half hour, and I'm just going to do it. I'm committed to it, Lord, and as busy as I am, it's too bad, I will go out. At, this morning I was out at quarter to six, you know. Um, I'm going to go out regardless. And when I start that kind of practice, what I've discovered is that you start going to bed sooner. You, you don't, you know, the distractions that keep you up at night, uh, you say, I'm, I'm doggone tired. I got up at 4 o'clock yesterday morning, and, I, and um, that's when I needed to get up to, to be with God. And so I'm going to do that again and again. I'm shifting it later now. <laughs> to now 5.30 or 6, you know, you just stick to that time, and then somehow you, you find that you're maintaining your touch a whole lot better. Uh, I think we probably have time for, for one more. Um, and is there a, um, a milestone in your experience of um, hearing God's voice and walking the Christian path uh, where you've, you've really followed your convictions out to the extreme and really felt blessed by um, listening to God's voice or his, the ideas that he's prompting you with, and it's been my impactful. Stones are important to everybody. We think back to my told a story of one that happened many years ago. But what's more important to me is what happened yesterday or the day before. And I was moved emotionally to turn around and see a sunrise, to suddenly awakened to the fact that I was seeing and that uh, God was talking to me and that that very walk where I started out in the fog and came back seeing more was when I was getting bright ideas for this talk. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. just, it's just phenomenal. So I, I see there's those milestones, but they have to have this weekly and daily uh, up refreshing. Yeah, well, thank you for your time. Um, let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we give you thanks for being present in this place. Um, the desire of our hearts, the thematic thread that runs throughout the chapels this year is that we would hear from you. And what that looks like and personal perspective and the hearts of us all um, that may be experienced different, that might look different. Um, but God, we want to know you. We want to be directed by you. Uh, we want to give our lives in service to you. And so I pray, Lord, today that you would honor the hearts in this room that have that longing and that you would truly and abundantly bless us as we pursue you uh, in this life and journey of faith. This is our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if we could have a quiet, we have two announcements for you, so you can go ahead and take a seat. You won't be swiped out yet because chapel's not over. Thank you so much. All right, we have Rihanna from BSCF and Andre from AUSA with an announcement for us. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Just a quick announcement for you guys. This coming week, we're having a campus-wide Spirit Week. BSCF and AUSA are hosting the Spirit Week for you guys. Um, it is just something that's supposed to get us hyped and excited for the Oakwood versus Angie's game. And the days are, Monday we're going to have Nerd Day, so everyone should come out in their glasses and their tape and their suspenders and their high socks and everything like that. On Tuesday, we have Twin Day, and you can also come as quadruplets and stuff like that as well. On Wednesday, we have Cardinal Day, 
and that's a time for everyone to come in the black, the red, the white, and we're also gonna have a pep rally that night as well. And at that pep rally, we're gonna crown a king and queen of Spirit Week, so make sure you guys are going really hard with um, all your spirit for the week. And on Thursday, the final day will be Rep Your Set Day, and that's basically a chance for you guys to come in all your gear that represents the state you're from, the country you're from, and stuff like that. So I'm from Colorado, so I'm gonna have my Colorado hat on, my hoodie, and all that stuff. So make sure you guys come out and support Spirit Week. If you have any questions, you can contact myself or Sandra Owasa. Okay, now for AUSA, just a quick show of hands. Who in here enjoys doing something on the weekend other than staying in their room? <laughs> now, who usually does not have money to do something other than stay in their room? <laughs> We're all in the same boat. Okay, this weekend, AUSA has um, took the liberty of putting on a fall festival for you at Barbet Farm, which is down the road. Now, what the fall festival is, it's kind of a time where you can come out, you don't have to pay, we're, taking, we're gonna provide transportation, take you out there. We're gonna have laser tag, a corn maze, a mechanical bull, um, a bounce castle, face painting, pumpkin painting, pizzas, hot drinks. Pretty much, just, you're gonna be able to come out and you know, tap into that inner child. Just, just relax from the week. We're having good weather right now. We encourage everybody to come out. Um, we have a bus that is leaving from PMC at 7.30 and the event is gonna continue to go until 11. Um, if you're interested, meet out by PMC. The bus will take you to the event and from the event. We look forward to seeing everybody out there Saturday night. Thank you for coming to chapel. Have a great weekend.